so the, the first, again, like I said before, sort of the first kind of initial idea behind this particular course is that you're going to learn how to think about economic issues, primarily economic issues, but also, again, like I said, political issues, policy issues, you know, business decisions, you know, so on and so forth, and, and to be able to model them. And, and then the models become this source of predictive power. And, and the better you are at thinking about these issues in a theoretical way, the better the theories you're going to construct will be. And then the more useful those theories will be um, to whatever it is you want to use them for, whether you want to use them if you're a marketing major and you get a job uh, uh, you know, doing marketing for a firm, we'll certainly cover, cover topics in this course that would be beneficial to any you know, marketing job or whether we're having a conversation about you know, environmental policy and, and what is you know, uh, you know, a way to think about environmental issues, again, from an economic perspective, that would certainly be beneficial to someone who plans to go on and work in that particular area. So again, we will highlight the use of economic models and then place that sort of directly in the perspective of how it can then be useful, you know, to a broad range of topic areas. Um, in the first chapter, I developed uh, a theoretical uh, model for um, apartments. And so in this equation you see here, we have uh, the, the rent of an apartment, the annual rent of an apartment it is equal to uh, $5,000, which is just the constant in this equation, plus one divided by 10 times I. I here is the median income of, of this, this particular neighborhood. So we're gonna think about rental prices of apartments in a given neighborhood, and, and basically what this theory says, what this particular model says, is that as income goes up, um, the rental price of an apartment goes up. So if the neighborhood has higher income, we predict or we expect that the rental prices of those apartments will be uh, more expensive. Again, I don't think there's anything controversial about this statement, and this illustrates two points. The first point is that your models need to make sense. There needs to be some intuitiveness. The word intuitive is very important. Um, we will talk about rationality and how we often build into our economic models at a minimum some form of rationality. I think that this is a fairly rational model to think that as, as the incomes of a neighborhood go up, the rental price of an apartment uh, would also go up. Now, of course, the other thing that this uh, theoretical model highlights is the limitations of theory. Because the truth is, is that we know that there are probably a lot more variables that would affect the rental price of an apartment. And we can, in fact, stick them in here. You know, we could look at crime, for example, and we could, you know, put crime as a variable on this side, right? And crime probably has a negative effect uh, as it pertains to rent. We could look at school quality, you know, how, how good are the schools of this particular neighborhood. And again, if, if school quality is going up, we may expect that to put upward pressure um, on apartment rental prices. But, but notice that by simply framing this question around a mathematical model, we are simplifying our ability to ask and then ultimately answer these questions. So we can look at this from a theoretical perspective and we can say, well, this model says that median income is gonna have a positive influence on rent, right? They are positively correlated. As income goes up, rental price goes up. Well, if I were to stick crime into this model, I would most likely give it a negative value. Again, theorizing that crime is gonna put downward pressure on rental prices, right? So income is putting upward pressure on rental prices and crime is putting downward pressure on rental prices, right? And then again, school quality, so on and so forth. Now, one limitation, of course, is that there are often correlations between those variables. So crime rates and income are not independent of each other. Uh, neither school quality and, and income, neither of those are not independent of each other. So it becomes a little bit difficult for us to, in a theoretical sense, parse out precisely what are those relationships. But the point of the model, the point of the theoretical model, is for us to make predictions about the underlying relationship that we believe explains the rental price of an apartment. An empirical model would look at this question from a very similar perspective. Notice rent is on the left-hand side of this equation as well. Now in this model, what you'll notice is that the uh, 
two variables inside the model are size, that's the size of the apartment, and then the crime, that is the, the crime within the particular neighborhood. Um, you'll notice that each of those variables has what we call a coefficient. Size has alpha, uh, crime has omega. And then you'll also notice there are two other variables in the model, uh, beta, which here is just a constant, uh, and u, which is an error term. Um, we're not going to get too far into the statistical properties here. That's a little bit beyond this particular course. But suffice it to say that this is what we would call an empirical model. And in this particular empirical model, what we would be in a sense theorizing is that the two contributing factors to the rental price of an apartment are a how big the apartment is and b how much crime there happens to be in that particular neighborhood then what we would do is we would collect data on that particular uh, set of apartments so we would get data on a bunch of apartments we would get the size of those apartments we would get the rental prices of those apartments we would get the crime rates of the neighborhoods of those apartments then we would run what we call regression analysis a statistical uh, magic so to speak in which we are able to estimate now the causal relationships between the size of an apartment and the rental price or the, the crime rate we're actually able to see what those underlying relationships are. So here what you have is um, a, a hypothetical uh, you know, square footage annual rental rate um, uh, for apartments, you know, what, what that would probably look like. You see all the different data points. There are some apartments which are very expensive but are very small. Think about like Midtown Manhattan apartments and then other uh, instances there are apartments which are very large and, and not that expensive, right? Think about, think about like out in Queens where you can tend to get somewhat cheaper apartments. So, you know, here we're not necessarily saying, you know, for example, median income is equal to, you know, affects rent by exactly one tenth. We're now estimating how much, you know, square footage or crime, what those effects would be. Notice in the theoretical model, we, we out and out say one tenth, whereas in a, an empirical model, um, we are estimating those sizes, those effects. How much does an additional square footage affect the rental price uh, of an apartment? How much does an increase or a decrease in the crime rate affect the, the rental price of an apartment? Here's a hypothetical for crime rates. Again, it's, it's negative. So if you look at crime rates and rental prices, this is the behavior you'll see. As, as crime rates go up, uh, rental prices go down. Whereas obviously before, as the square footage of apartments went up, rental prices rose, as we would expect. You know, sometimes empirical findings align completely with our assumptions. Other times, they don't. The classical way to look at kind of the, the 30,000 foot view of all of this, you know, rental markets, automobile markets, clothing markets, food markets, energy markets, whatever the market is and, and whatever it contributes to overall, you know, economic growth, we have what we call the circular flow. You know, we can think about this as a positive feedback. What that means is that production and consumption feed into each other. Right, consumption creates a, a reason to produce, and, and production creates, in a sense, a reason to consume or a means to consume. Right, so people get jobs making products that then gives them incomes that they can consume, which increases the need for productive firms. And, right, this is how you grow your economic system. And we've seen uh, that, especially in the 20th century, a tremendous amount of success amongst a tremendous number of economies at growing themselves, at, at not only uh, you know, increasing the amount of people who get a piece of the economic pie, but in fact growing that economic pie as well. Now, of course, there are inherent problems with this, right? So if we just look at the, the positive feedback loop part of it, it, it looks like, okay, if you look at the U.S. economy, it's grown tremendously over the last 50 years, right? It's, it's a real success story. But then if you start peeling back that economic onion a little bit, and you see, for example, that income inequality, in the U.S. right now is has not been as bad as it's been, you know, since the Gilded Era of the late 1800s. You know, a time period where we, we literally look back on that time period and, and almost with a sense of shame, like how did we allow income inequality to get that bad? And we're kind of back to that point now, where where we look at that and we go, okay, income inequality is 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 going to cut into future economic growth. So maybe economic growth has created a, an income. A, 
unequal income outcome, but maybe eventually that income inequality is actually going to reduce um, you know, our ability to grow the economy over time. And there's certainly other, other issues as well uh, as it pertains to economic growth. Um, one big one, of course, is you know, the uh, level of pollution and environmental degradation and resource exhaustion that has gone on uh, over the last 50 years especially. There's been a tremendous increase in economic growth globally. Um, globalization has brought a lot of wealth and, and economic growth to a lot of different countries, and it really has been a tremendous success story. If you look at just the sheer level of, of educational improvements that have occurred all over the globe, uh, globe infant mortality, uh, fewer women dying in childbirth, more women becoming educated, these are all associated with economic growth. Economic growth has enabled improvements in all these particular areas. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that everything is been Right? And it doesn't mean that we can't look at those, those sort of more normative considerations and, and then again draw conclusions that maybe there might be a better way. And I think right now, one of the biggest focuses we have, especially in the United States, is that, that issue of, of environmental degradation. How do we disentangle economic growth from environmental degradation? That's a pretty big issue. Well, it's been a big issue for a long time, right? So in the late 1700s, uh, Thomas Malthus, uh, who was a political economic philosopher, um, he theorized what we, you know, here's theory, um, he theorized what we call the Malthusian catastrophe. And the idea was that food supply grew um, arithmetically or linearly, um, and food demand, that is population basically, uh, tended to grow geometrically, right, or exponentially. And what this meant was that, was that at a certain point in the future, there would be a crossing of those paths, and now food demand would outstrip food supply, and this could potentially lead to widespread famine. This is one of the earlier instances of sustainability concerns showing up within popular economics. Malthus was amongst what we would call the classical economists, uh, Adam Smith, David Ricardo. I talk about this in the chapter a little bit more at length. Um, but the point here is that he was theorizing an economic model to explain the concern of sustainability, right? Now, the question becomes, was he correct? Well, if you look at countries like the United States, we've really had not much of an issue, um, you know, increasing our ability to grow the food supply. So technological innovation has allowed us to, uh, you know, take this linear food supply curve and bend it exponential as well. Now, of course, in the U.S., we deal with the fact that there are still certainly some families that uh, are food insecure. At the same time, we have a tremendous amount of food waste, for example. So just because we have avoided through technological advancements this, so this famine, it doesn't necessarily mean that our food markets are what we would call inefficient, or I'm sorry, what we would call efficient, um, for example. Now, the truth is, is that in some countries where their economic systems are so bad and their political and legal systems are so bad that their food supply is actually very linear, um, maybe because their country is not able to, say, grow their own agriculture, which certainly occurs, so they rely upon international trade to bring in products into that particular country or if there are natural disasters like droughts, for example, which severely curtail a uh, country's um, food supply, then we have seen, in fact, large-scale famines, um, you know, as late as the last, you know, 10, 15 years in parts of sub-Saharan sub Africa um, and other parts of the world. And so, despite the fact that in some countries um, technology has allowed this, it does not necessarily mean that the question of sustainability has been answered. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't remain concerned about, you know, what is this economic growth? What are the strains that it's putting? And or, uh, you know, is the, the prosperity being generated by economic growth uh, being shared? And, and is the sharing of that prosperity, um, you know, again, achieving what we want to achieve? Um, I'm a capitalist. I, I support capitalist economic systems. I think they are the best alternative that we have. Now, I also am someone who thinks that we should have a large social safety net. So we should have a universal healthcare system. So if we're going to have a capitalist economic system, which again, I think we should, and we want to take advantage of all that economic 
growth, we need to smooth over, if you will, the rougher edges of capitalism. And you see many countries, especially in Western Europe, who have successfully done this. We have in the United States been a little bit less successful in terms of things like income inequality, um, but we certainly get other things um, quite well uh, as well. Um, and this to show you again that this co concern about sustainability is not something that we uh, can ignore because we have you know, technology and all these other things. Um, if you just look at uh, fish landing, so this is catching fish um, off the coast of California for two fish, uh, bluefin tuna, which obviously is extremely important as an economic commodity globally, um, and chub mackerel, which regionally is a very important commodity in that part of the Pacific Ocean in uh, California, uh, Oregon, and Washington. Um, and as you can see in, in the case of both fish, that there is a dramatic uptick in catch catches, and then over time, those catches have dwindled. Um, what you're seeing here is what we call fishery collapse. And fishery collapse occurs when commercial fishing catches so many fish at a short time period that the ecosystem is not able to rebound. Um, simultaneously, you also have environmental disruption of these fisheries through increasing human activity. Um, California also has a lot of oil drilling off of its coast as well, which has been known to reduce fishing population as well. But again, to, to point out here is that this is a circumstance where economic human behavior creates an unsustainable position. Um, and, and the natural economics of fisheries leads many of them to collapse. Again, what we call fishery collapse. Um, but as we will learn much later in the course, um, towards the end, there's a avenue for economics to play a role here to positively impact fisheries. And instead of economics causing fishery collapse, we can in fact rely upon economics to prevent it. All right. So that's gonna be the end of this first lecture video. I went a little bit longer than I wanted to, but again, I just wanted to kind of give you a brief introduction into you know, what it is we're gonna do in this particular course, and also give you kind of, again, a way to think about economics and a, and a way to frame you know, what we're gonna do uh, throughout the semester, all right? I'll see you in the next lecture video.